Hi, I'm Gail McCarricker. I'm a clinical psychologist at Birmingham Children's Hospital. I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person today, um, but I hope that by sharing this recording, it helps you to access some of these resources and materials. I am going to try and share my screen and hopefully record and hopefully this will work out. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. I've, I've been to this conference in a number of years and really enjoyed it. And I'm sorry I'm not there in person because the best bit is always the conversations around the drinks tables and conversations over lunch. So I'm sorry we're missing out on that this year. So I've been asked to think a little bit about well-being and resilience, and in particular, thinking a little bit about coming out of lockdown and whatever that means for us. Um, in thinking about this, I, I came across a project that was called the Young Scott Sketch Project, in which lots of young people in Scotland were asked to just write down, capture words that represented their experience of lockdown. And this is the image that kind of captures the variety of, of words that, that young people used. I think whether you've overall felt like you've had a good experience of lockdown, um, or whether you found it an incredibly challenging experience of lockdown. There's something in this world all for all of us. I think we can all identify with some bits of this and some of them may have felt helpful and some of them may have felt a lot less helpful. But hopefully there are some things in there that we can connect to. Um, taking a completely different approach uh, during a strange conversation, we were trying to think of um, film titles that kind of summed up your experience of lockdown. And that, that became quite a fun way to try and capture the sentiment, but also to capture the different ranges of feelings that people might have experienced and, and kind of think about that as a group. And this can feel like a really safe way to kind of think about it with other people, to see if you can think of, you know, a title that captures maybe some of the fun bits or the strange bits or the weird bits or the sad bits or the lonely bits or the upsetting bits or the anxious bits or whatever the bits that are in your mind on that particular day. But I was just really struck by the kind of range of different titles people went for. So I'm sure we can identify with the mask, you know, isolate five feet apart, that's definitely been a big part of our world in the last 18 months. Brassed off, I'm sure we can all identify days where we felt like that. Groundhog Day, that challenge of just finding some structure and variation and variety in your day. Quarantine, social network, you know, where our contacts and connections with people happen via social media or WhatsApp or, you know, any variety of social platforms that you might be on. Home alone, you know, that might have been a very lonely time. You might have been isolating by yourself and been engaging in, you know, your own conversations with uh, Wilson, like um, Tom Hanks's character in Castaway. A life less ordinary was an interesting one, I thought. Or um, Back to the Future. Are we in a post-apocalyptic kind of world or, or what? From here to eternity, that sense of never ending relentlessness that, that was often present during those kind of, again, groundhog days. A quiet place. It might have felt like a quiet place where you are. It might have felt like quite a busy place. Um, I was talking with a mum who has um, seven children all under the age of eight. And I was imagining that's not a very quiet place. Carry on regardless, that kind of sense of um, making do, getting on with things. 28 weeks later, a cabin fever. I'm sure we can all kind of relate to some sense or experience of staring at the same four walls and feeling that need to perhaps just have a change of scenery, a change of walls. It might be outside, it might just be a different room that sense of treating yourself to sit in a different room to get a different perspective within your own house, okay? 
It might not be what it looks like. It might be how it feels. It might be temperature. It might be who else is around you. It might just be having a different kind of seat. It might be standing up. All of those things suddenly became quite important when they're a big part of your day. So sometimes using a little bit of, I guess, humour, a bit of creativity can help to capture the emotion of what's going on in that moment without it having to feel like a particularly big emotional conversation. I think, I think we all can guess and know that everybody has definitely been affected by lockdown um, to some extent. It's impacted on everybody. We know that some groups have been what's, what's often coined as disproportionately affected. And I think when you consider, um, this, is, this is from a, a fairly recent paper in Scotland, um, when you think about those who've been disproportionately affected, people may fit in more than one of these categories. You know, they may fit in, they might describe themselves in more than one group. And therefore we can only imagine maybe may have a compound um, impact of disproportional affectation or being affected in a disproportionate way is probably a better way for me to describe it and I guess a really important aspect here is you know people with pre-existing chronic health conditions um, and we know that um, for those who have ongoing chronic health conditions that new challenges are often compounded by the impact of their pre-existing difficulties we, we hear an awful lot about resilience and it does definitely feel like the buzzword of the moment. I feel like everywhere I go, everybody's asking me about resilience and how to be resilient and how to build resilience. And I guess I'm struck by the fact that often people talk about resilience as if it's the magic cure for lots of things. And I think it's really important that we kind of remember what resilience means, you know, kind of. Resilience is really about a human being's capacity to adapt to changes, to new situations, and our ability to bounce back from that difficult and challenging situations. Human beings are pretty amazing creatures. You know, we have really big brains and we have really thick, big cerebral cortexes. And one of the big jobs of our cerebral cortex is to help our adaptability. And it's why humans live all over the planet. You know, we live in high places and low places and wet places and dry places and, you know, in all sorts of climates and in all sorts of terrains, you will find human beings who have adapted and thrive in that place. So as a species, we're very adaptable. And sometimes... Um, it's not just that we have one way of bouncing back. I'm sure we can all think about some days when we feel like our bounciness is better than other days and perhaps some weeks, some months, some years when our bounciness um, is better than others. Or sometimes depending on who's around us or what the thing is, what the challenge is that we're bouncing back from. So it's not as simple for us to just say we are adaptable and we've got good bounce back, you know, kind of these things have a context. And sometimes, you know, that context is quite sensitive for us as individuals. Okay. Over the years, and, I, and I've taken this from work by Jim Lemon and, and his team who have pulled this together from decades and much more of work that's been done by scientists in all different fields and it's trying to accumulate um, the evidence from as I say many different disciplines within psychology the sciences and, and social literature it's about what do human beings need in order to live well and I think it's important for us to hold on to this that living well can mean different things to different people so there's not one sense of what that living well should be like. But generally speaking, what these decades and decades of, of work tell us is that there are some pretty clear things, and I think it's eight if my maths is 
is uh, acceptable today, <laughs> you know, is to think that these are the things that largely speaking, human beings need to eat well. And when you read the titles in these, each of these squares, they probably won't sound like rocket science. And I think that's also really important too, because when life is difficult, we are often feeling really overwhelmed, you know, as if there's a lot going on, there's a lot to take on board, there's a lot to get used to. Things are changing quite often at a fast pace. So trying to do anything too complicated often stretches the limited resources that we have. So knowing that there are simple things we can do is really helpful, I think. So just to run through what these eight things are, we've got reducing our exposure to toxins. Now, straight away, that probably makes us think of harmful substances, you know, kind of bleach and drain cleaners. And, and those things are indeed toxins. But it's also important for us to think about the things that we find toxic in our everyday life. So that might be social media, you know, that might be particular conversations of particular people, you know, things that are toxic in our environment that day. Okay. I really like the next one because I'm, I'm not always great at sleeping. And so I really like how this one is phrased. It's phrased as eight hours sleep opportunity. And so it's not setting you up to say, if you get anything less than eight hours, then it's been a disaster. It's just sort of saying, trying to create an opportunity and see how far you get. But good sleep makes everything feel better. Eating real food. And again, that sense of real could be very different for different people. But that sense of trying to, um, you know, eat some real food that feels nutritious for you. That doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be complicated. I sometimes feel like when I feel like I need to eat better, it gets really complicated and then I get quite quickly overwhelmed. But when I let myself remember that maybe, you know, eating beans on toast might be really helpful, you know, nutritious and real food, you know, not, not highly processed food is a helpful place to start. Small steps. I also love the idea of just moving, okay? So again, we sometimes can set ourselves really ambitious exercise targets and really um, big goals that make us feel like, right, you know, through lockdown, I'm going to suddenly start running marathons. Um, I'm never going to run marathons. But if I help myself think I just need to move a bit more, I might go up the stairs a bit more, I might walk to the co-op that's just up the road rather than taking the car all those little individual choices that help you to just move a little bit more and allow you to kind of appreciate your body and the way it moves as well connecting with others is a really important one and um i guess also this means thinking about how we connect with others and this very well might link with reducing toxins you know kind of how we choose to connect with others who we choose to connect with and how we set ourselves some boundaries around that connection might be really important. I think a thing we often hear talked about when we think about resilience is purpose, you know, having a purpose. And that really means sort of co contributing to something that's bigger than just you. And that could be something really big, like um, a national project. You know, it might be something really small. It might be doing something for your next door neighbor or contributing to something in your local community. But that idea of contributing to something that's not just about you is often really important. Self-compassion is one that's often overlooked, like being a little bit kind to ourselves. We are often much kinder to others than we are to ourselves and hold ourselves to very different standards and have very different views of what's acceptable to ourselves versus what we think is acceptable to others. And it sometimes helps to think about, um, would I say the things I say to myself to someone else? Like, would I say them out loud to somebody else? And if the answer is no, then the chances are we're being a bit harsh on ourselves. Okay. Being mindful. Again, there's, we hear an awful lot of stuff about mindfulness um, at the moment. And, and I guess my experience of mindfulness is 
really varied. I'm a huge fan of mindfulness. I hear a lot of things described as mindfulness that I don't think are particularly mindful. So I think just the true sense of being mindful is about being present in the moment you are in, allowing yourself to feel the things you feel and being present in your body, in your day-to-day -day life, okay? And those are kind of pretty important things for us to think about. Individually, they all sound pretty straightforward. There's nothing in there that sounds particularly fancy or like you have to go away on a really complicated course to learn how to do. But actually, when we think about it, putting them into practice can be a bit harder. Okay, um, Getting them going can be hard, but keeping them going can also be hard. So we always find it's helpful to just think about small steps in the right direction rather than setting ourselves goals like right I'm going to have half an hour of social media a day I'm going to sleep eight hours every day I'm going to cook every single meal from scratch I'm going to run 10k every day I'm going to be a social butterfly on all the various kind of groups that I'm in I'm going to do big astounding things on my local community projects I'm going to do loads of self-care and I'm going to be really mindful in how I do it. I know I can easily fall into that trap and I can sit and look at that diagram and, and write all those things down. But I suspect if I achieve one or two of them, I'll be really lucky. So that idea of really small steps, what can I do that will help me today? What, do I, what can I do that's going to help me feel like I've made a little bit of progress? So you know, last week I ate two meals that I cooked. Maybe this week I'll try and make three. Do you know, maybe I'll do a bit of batch cooking on Sunday so I know I've got three home-cooked meals in the freezer that makes me feel like the pressure's off a little bit. That's a little bit of self-compassion and it's a little bit of eating real food. So how do I start to bring these things together just to help me feel like I'm making some progress, okay? I don't have to do it all, all of the time. 100%. We've just got some little ideas here to kind of think a little bit about each of those in a little bit more detail. So you can, these are just a few suggestions. Don't feel tied to these in any way whatsoever. Please, you know, think of your own, scr scrabble them down on a bit of paper, write them on your calendar, put them in your phone. You know, some ideas about removing toxins, you know, exposure to toxin. Time away from social media. I think time away from the news, a lot of people felt was important during lockdown. It just felt like the news was full of doom and gloom. Maybe a little bit of screen-free time rather than say, I'm only going to have this many hours of screen time. Turn it the other way around. I'm going to have half an hour that's screen-free time so that you're, again, not putting yourself under pressure. Maybe a little bit less alcohol. Maybe a little bit of time away from stressful conversations. Maybe thinking about where I'm getting information from, making sure it's from a, a trusted source rather than finding myself down every rabbit hole of every conspiracy theory going. Thinking a little bit about the eight hours sleep opportunity. What can I do to get myself and my body and my mind in the best frame of mind for a good sleep opportunity? A lot of the things that impact on our sleep are things that are happening in the build up to sleep, nothing to do with the actual sleep itself. So a good winding down routine before bed, giving our bodies lots of cues that it's time to switch off, it's time to relax, it's time to kind of unwind. Work out what that means for you. It might mean soothing music, it might mean a relaxing bath, it might mean some meditation, it might mean lots of exercise. It can be really different things for different people. Really simple things like buy a new pillow or put on a new, a fresh pillowcase. Sometimes those little touches can really help us to kind of approach it with a different um, kind of mindset. Think about the temperature in your bedroom, making sure that bed is comfortable, you know, making sure that you've tucked the sheet in so that it's not all caught up around you when you're tossing and turning, perhaps. Give the duvet a big shake so it's all nice and light and airy and fluffy makes a really big difference. If you're aware that you've got worries before you get into bed, do something about managing those worries. Write them down. 
They'll still be there in the morning. You don't have to hold them in your head. Sometimes we go over and over things in our head because mainly because we're worried we'll forget about them. So finding an alternative way to hold them in mind. If you really can't sleep, you know, and you feel like you're lying in bed tossing and turning and just sleep is not coming, quite often the more we lie there, the worse it gets. And then we start clock watching. If I fall asleep now, I'll only get six hours of sleep. If I fall asleep now, I'll only get four hours of sleep. And quite often we're actually better if we get up, do something, walk around, go downstairs, get a drink of water, go to the toilet, you know, do five star jumps. If you're feeling really energetic, do 10 star jumps and then have another go at coming back to bed. Give the duvet a shake, turn over the pillow, think about the temperature of the room, cue yourself back in. Okay. The eating real food, I think, is one that, you know, I'm sure that we all know stuff like how many of us eat as many pieces of fruit as we should, how many of us have our five a day, seven a day, 10 a day, um, you know, all of these kind of things. It's about how we try. It's how we make small improvements. Try having one piece of fruit a few times a week. You know, it's not setting ourselves big tasks. Cook something lovely, simple and comforting is often best. Try it out, have a go at a new recipe, but you know, pick one that looks straightforward and simple and doesn't have you scouring the shelves in the supermarket with something really rare and random that you don't really know what it is. I hate that bit when you go to the supermarket, you don't even know which area of the supermarket you should be thinking about or trying to find it in. So thinking about moving, it's not just about high energy impact exercise. It could be when I'm bending down to pick stuff up, I'm just going to squeeze my tummy a little bit more. I'm going to squeeze my tummy when I'm breathing while I'm eating. I'm just going to, you know, hold my tummy in and squeeze my bottom, squeeze my tummy when I'm waiting for the kettle to boil. It could be as simple as that. Could be a few more trips up the stairs could be a walk around the block and it could be a short online exercise class or it could be full on impact exercise. Choose something that works for you. Connecting, I'm sure we've all kind of tried lots of different versions of these and um, with the good bits and the not so good bits. Could be a text, a video chat, FaceTime, an old fashioned conversation. I love it. Someone said, just write a good old fashioned letter. It's amazing how that feels to receive a letter, something that lots of people aren't used to perhaps these days. Mindfulness, just being present in what you're doing in an everyday task. When you're doing the washing up, how does the water feel? Can you smell the bubble bath in the bath? What's the temperature of the water for the washing up? Can you hear the birds singing? What sort of noise does the kettle make when it boils? You know, all of these little things are just about being present in the moment. Take a few minutes to try some mindfulness exercise. There's some great mindfulness apps out there and I've made some reference to some of them um, at the end of the, of the presentation. We've had some experiences of, you know, clapping for key workers, contributing to something bigger than us. There's been lots of community WhatsApp kind of groups going on volunteering, helping out, um, donating to a charity if you can. That could be your time, it could be your energy, it, it may be financial. Could you buy a product that supports a charity? I, I kind of was really um, excited. I found a bar of soap um, in which the, the packaging actually said, please steal our staff. We really, we, we employ staff with, um, physical and learning disabilities, and we really want you to poach our staff and employ them to be part of your team. And I thought that was amazing. I was just really bowled over by this amazing kind of marketing tactic. Most of all, be a little bit kind to ourselves in the things we think in particular, and the things that we say and do to ourselves and for ourselves. Give ourselves a little bit of time. Be understanding when things don't quite go to, ply, to plan. Be proud of the things we do achieve, even if they seem really small. Rewarding ourselves for our achievements, big and small, is really, really important. And sometimes it's really good just to do something just for no other reason other than the fact it makes you feel good. And that's really important. So some top tips in there, maybe things like 
planning your time, finding a routine that works for you. Focus on the present. What is best for my recovery right now? What do I need to do right now? Celebrate your achievements. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Find a way to make it work. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody about it's really hard to put her blazer on because she's sitting in her wheelchair. Um, and so we had lots of experiments of ways of putting the blazer on that made it doable. And it might not look like the most attractive or the most, you know, she was saying that looks really clumsy the way we did it, but it worked best. So we just kept experimenting until we found a way to make it work. Expressing your gratitude, it sounds a little bit trite, but actually it's really pretty powerful. When things feel really difficult and really bad, um, it can often be really helpful to think about what are we grateful for? When there are things that our bodies can't do for us or that help that make it difficult for us to do or we feel like sometimes our body lets us down, what are the other things our body lets us do that actually is really important to us? That might be being able to cuddle a child or um, soothe a grandchild or you know, um, smell your favorite perfume. You know, there might be lots of other things that your body can allow you to do, but in that moment, it's hard to remember. One of the things I think it's been universal for everybody around the planet during this kind of COVID experience has been the sense of uncertainty and feeling out of control. But so many things have been outside of our control unsure what's happening next, not sure what the new rules will be, not sure what you can and can't do. And in those kind of circumstances, being able to focus on what is in your control, what can you do something about, what action, action can you take is pretty powerful. There's also a whole lot of learning we can do from our past. If we think about what situations have I managed in the past? What did I learn about myself and my ways of coping and managing? And how can I use those things in this situation? And I think really importantly, we often think when we're feeling big feelings, especially when we're feeling overwhelmed, that we try to not feel our feelings. We almost avoid our feelings. But actually, quite often that just makes them build up. And then they can catch us by surprise when they get really intense and they bubble over. So allowing ourselves to feel our feelings and allow them to kind of just be present with us, not getting too wrapped up on them and acknowledging that they too are transitory things. You know, so sometimes um, I know sometimes um, it's helpful to think about your feelings a little bit like, you know, the weather. So um, if you think about the weather, you can come outside, sit in the garden, and it feels really pretty miserable. It could be raining, it could be cold, it might be snowy or kind of thundery, but actually that weather changes, you know, and, and sort of what kind of weather can I see, hear, feel, imagine in the future? Um, and how might that change? And is there anything I can do to just move myself a little bit closer to that, that changing weather? Sleep is such an important thing, and I thought it might just be helpful. There's um, the NHS um, website, and this is the link to the, their kind of little video, has something called meditation, and it's a little bit of stretching, which is just quite helpful to kind of relax your body. And it is a little bit of stretching, and it has a little bit of breathing, um, just to help you get into that relaxed frame of mind before bed. There are also a couple of apps that are sometimes helpful. So Sleepio is an, an app that's specifically aimed at um, supporting you with sleep. And Smiling Mind and, and Headspace are both apps that are focused around relaxation and mindfulness. Um, so they're, they're really good. And the Smiling Mind has lots of really short little scripts as well. It's um, American, it not, that's a lie. It's Australian, not American. Um, and they have a whole range of lots of different scripts. So sort of have a play and see if you can find one that, that suits you. Okay. I think the other thing that can be really helpful is to acknowledge those times when 
You might just feel a little bit overwhelmed that can make sleep feel really hard. So sometimes that being able to ground ourselves into the moment we're in and get back into our bodies, you know, when we feel quite in our heads or when our heads get really busy, we sometimes feel a little bit out our heads. We're kind of up here and a bit frantic. And so sometimes it's really helpful to just find a comfortable place to sit, take a few deep kind of calming breaths and then just think about where you are and have that little moment to think about five things that you can see, four things that you can feel or touch, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. So this is just a little exercise that takes a few minutes to do once you've gone through all of the senses, have a few more minutes at the end. And I was hoping that we could maybe sit and do this together today. So I'm sorry we can't do it together, but maybe, you know, if you're watching this, have a go at it yourself. Just take a few minutes to ground yourself in the moment and really anchor yourself in your body, in the space that you're in. And it often brings a real sense of calm to that busyness that, that was in your head beforehand. I think the other thing that's just really important for us to hold on to is, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, the picture's worth a thousand words. And for me, I really love this image because I think we get so much further with lots of tiny steps than we do with big, big leaps, you know. Um, I was saying, I always am amazed. I loved watching the Olympics and the Paralympics, but I'm astounded when I watch triple jumpers. I just, I can't understand how people can do it. But I guess what I hold on to is that, you know, we don't always have to be taking those great big giant leaps. And sometimes those leaps are so big that we feel like we can't even catch the first rung, the first step. But lots of tiny steps really build our confidence with that sense of achievement and they help us feel that we keep moving. And so we're able then to learn from our successes. You know, what helps me? What have I learned about myself? Who around me helps me? Who around me helps me in this kind of situation? What's really important to me in my life? What are these values that I still want to find a way to connect with, even if I can't do it in quite the way that I usually do or that I want to do? How can I still keep moving forward towards those things I value? And ultimately, all of those tiny steps will take us great distances. OK, those were all the slides I had to um, share with you today. And I know it's a very brief kind of conversation. I really hope if you've got questions that you're able to email them in and I'll do my best to respond to them. And I hope you really enjoy the rest of um, your conference and have a lovely weekend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.